Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. Well, uh, tonight is the first night of Passover. Uh, as you know, an important uh, holiday in the Buddhist calendar. Um, and there are two prominent stories. Uh, we'll eventually get around to applying this in, in, to Buddhism. But um, there are two prominent stories of slavery in the United States uh, that define a group in their history. Uh, the most important one, of course, is the story of African-Americans who were brought here as slaves and who were uh, deeply and continuously harmed by racism and the aftermath of their enslavement. And the other is more ancient and more remote, but also has its origin in the African continent. And that is the story of the ancient Jews and their enslavement by the Egyptians. There aren't that many groups in the world whose identity has been defined by a story of past enslavement and liberation from that enslavement. Although there are probably others um, that I'm not as familiar with. But the Jews along with African-Americans have this distinction in our culture, uh, which is commemorated in tonight's celebration of Passover. And it has been uh, noticed and, um, and utilized by the black uh, civil rights movement as well, uh, which has also sometimes led to alliances between Jews and blacks on uh, progressive and anti-racism issues. Uh, the old black spiritual has the words which African-Americans took strength in during the civil rights movement, which references the enslavement of the Jews. And I'm going to sing. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Thank you very much. So uh, this was... Uh, you know, a real reference between the blacks and the Jews. Um, and and uh, this old black spiritual commemorates the enslavement of the Jews in ancient Egypt, which we commemorate tonight. So after God brought the plagues uh, down on the Egyptians for uh, refusing to release the Jews from their slavery, um, they finally were let go and got away. And there's the parting of the Red Sea, which is uh, a nice uh, miracle, but not, not really pertinent to this metaphor. After their liberation, they had nowhere to live. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're no longer a slave, but good luck. <laughs> and they wandered in the desert, according to legend, living here and there. Uh, for 40 years, which is a very long time to be wandering. And eventually they found the promised land. Uh, that's a pretty simple outline of what happened, but it may serve as an example to us or as a, as a metaphor on the path of Zen as well, though not at all to minimize the literal enslavement that took place and what that might have been like and which continues to be an issue in many places in the world, including the US to this uh, very day. Um, it's generally no longer a direct issue for the Jews, but having been touched by slavery um, uh, is, a, is kind of a big thing to have in your history. And, and it's uh, very important to the Jews as they keep on reviewing what it was like to be enslaved and how important it is to, uh, to not accept uh, oppression, uh, but to um, 
fight the oppressor and get beyond it. And so it's an important uh, principle in Jewish culture. Now, you could say to torture this metaphor for our own benefit tonight, we are enslaved as Buddhists by dukkha, suffering. And the point of enslavement is that it's one of the worst kinds of suffering. So we have big suffering in Buddhist philosophy and we have little suffering. The big sufferings uh, can't really be avoided and are a part of the Buddhist story. Uh, major illnesses, uh, which we've, many of us have experienced lately. Uh, disasters, wars, seems like continual wars. Losing loved ones, which we've, many of us have also experienced in fairly recent times. And these are bad enough, these major life events that we can't avoid. But in addition to these major events that we somehow need to get through and recover from, we have what I think Buddha uh, very uh, particularly dis discerned, which is the micro suffering of being human that we are born into, the sense of continuous dissatisfaction and disappointment that the Buddha highlighted in his teaching. That all goes under the umbrella to me of dukkha, but there are also principles of realizing this suffering instead of trying to rationalize it and push it away that, uh, that were specific to the Buddhist path, uh, such as um, disenchantment, realizing that the things of the world and accumulating objects, uh, or clinging to certain special things is never going to satisfy you. So to go on from there, we could say that the only way to dispel this sense of constant dissatisfaction of life never being completely okay, and in a sense to reference our metaphor, to feel that you're constantly oppressed or captured or enslaved by this feeling of things never being quite right. Uh, that the Buddha highlighted in his teaching um, is to embrace the moment as it is and to realize that the aliveness and the presence that we have now is uh, going to constantly be going through this or that circumstance or condition, but that it itself is okay exactly as things are. Um, people sometimes do not like that idea that embracing the moment as it is and accepting it, not just intellectually, but embracing it emotionally uh, is a good thing to be able to say the way it is, is okay as it is, because they think it means that we're denying uh, the fact that things are not okay <laughs> in the world and that we really need to change them. But my I believe personally that the Zen principle of accepting the moment is not that we're then going to be content or lackadaisical and hang around denying all the things that are, are bad in the world and going wrong and causing suffering. Obviously in Mahayana Buddhism, we're very attentive to suffering and, and don't accept it um, as, a, as a necessary condition. Um, so there are many things that are wrong that need to be fixed, but unless we embrace the moment the way it is and start from this current reality, we can't really ground ourselves in reality and work properly from what really exists and find real solutions to the current problems because we're too busy denying, uh, rationalizing, or in other ways trying to get away from facing that reality. So we need to be able to squarely look at what exists and start from there. And there is a basic letting go involved in that because there are always going to be negative conditions from now till the end of our lives. And if we're constantly denying them or trying to fight them or being upset about them, then we'll never have a moment of peace. And so we need to do both. 
accept the moment and then see what is oppressing us and also do something about it. As Suzuki Roshi said, which uh, I like to repeat to myself a lot, um, you're perfect the way you are and you can use a little improvement. So if we can accept the moment as it is and even embrace it, we can make changes, but without that feeling that life is constantly disappointing us and that we are upset that we have no control, which we don't, um, or very little. And uh, so that in a way is if we, uh, are able to, to some extent, release that dissatisfaction and disappointment with things not going our way, it's getting rid of a basic oppression or enslavement uh, to dukkha. And Ikkyu has a little verse that summarized his solution to the problem. He wrote, my true home has no roof and no walls, so rain cannot damage it and wind cannot knock it down. So that which we are clinging to, that which we're holding on to, um, is always subject to uh, being attacked or destroyed. If we can reach the point where we're not clinging to things being this way or that way, we no longer have to worry about them going one way or the other way to the same extent. And that releases a major source of anxiety, but it's not so easy to achieve. So let's say we leave our old way of thinking and take refuge in our practice and believe that we can be liberated. We have moments of feeling liberated and being content with what is. We have moments where we're able to help others, but like everything else, this doesn't last and we're left with uncertainty and nowhere to stand. We are, back to the metaphor, wandering in the desert of reality and really don't know where we're gonna wind up or how, we, how it's gonna turn out. And the promised land, uh, the ideal of enlightenment or nirvana, uh, sometimes seems like a myth or a distant promise in our everyday life. So how do we stop wandering in the desert and find the promised land? How do we leave the enslavement of dukkha completely behind? The answer is that we don't. Taking one breath at a time, we embrace the moment. We let go, as Huang Po put it, with both hands and drop our expectations and, disappoint and disappointments with the exhalation. It's a moment to moment situation in practice. We hold the door for someone, we say a kind word, we contribute to a food bank, and we keep breathing out dukkha and breathing in the new moment of aliveness. After all, spiritually speaking, we are only enslaved by our own delusional thoughts and feelings. And wandering in the desert is not so bad if every place you go is a place where you can rest and breathe. Carrying Ikkyu's house with no walls along with us, maybe this moment right here is the promised land. And I'd like to end with my paraphrase of the koan that I should have looked up so that I could read it accurately. But uh, this is my translation of it from my own mind. So one day the master went out wandering in the mountains. Uh, when he came back, he was greeted by the head monk who said, where have you been master? And the master said, I'm coming back from wandering in the mountains. The head monk said, where did you go? And the master says, I went pursuing the fragrant grasses and I returned following the falling flowers. The head monk said, how very much like the sense of springtime. The master said, it even surpasses the morning dew dripping on the lotuses. And a later master read this and responded to it by saying, Thank you for your reply. So can we wander through life following the fragrant grasses and return following the falling flowers? 
it's a good sense of liberation for us to aspire towards and happy Passover.